Welcome to the Edge of NFT podcast with your hosts, Jeff Kelly, Ethan Janney, and Josh Krieger. We aim to bring you not only the top 1% of what's going on with NFTs today, but what will stand the test of time. We explore the nuts and bolts and the business side, but also the human element of how NFTs are changing the way we interact with the things that we love. This podcast is for the futurists and dreamers, the disruptors and creators, the fans and connectors, and the makers and doers that are pumped about this ecosystem and driving where it goes next. Good ribbit, gentlemen. How are you doing today? <laughs> Good ribbit, Ed. Uh, I think I'll come on, <clears throat> come on full camera here in a minute. But I thought it'd be fun to to flex one of my uh, one of my frogs as we start this session. <laughs> it's a good move. I'm not gonna lie, you got a good look at there. What's that? You've got a good looking frog there. One of the one of the, yeah. the fairer sexes of the frogs. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, well, uh, I'm I'm Ethan Janney, and and I am uh, a co-host of uh, the Edge of NFT podcast, uh, which brings folks the top one percent in nfts today as well as what will stand the test of time um, but here we are actually doing uh, an online uh, segment for the miami crypto experience um, in conjunction with crypto night and having a lot of fun here and we're going to do a panel on uh, things that are going on in the metaverse We've got two very interesting folks joining us today um, specifically we have uh, dan kennedy and ed Mason, and basically, um, what I'd love to do uh, as uh, as we get started here is just to hand it over to each of you to give give a sort of a bio of of yourself, what's going on with you, where you're from, um, and then we'll hop in and and get the get our hands dirty talking about what's going on with the metaverse. So, um, actually, Dan, I don't know that I met you before, so so let's kick it off with you. Why don't you give a little intro um, of your background and and your major projects right now? Sure. Yeah, definitely. So I'm uh, the CEO for Network, and we're a metaverse uh, built on the blockchain on Unreal Engine. And um, hey there. Yeah, so um, been in crypto since about 2012, uh, when Bitcoin was about 140 bucks. Um, yeah, so kind of been watching the scene for a while and, um, you know, very excited about what the metaverse is going to bring to you know, the world and, you know, how we have these great technologies, uh, you know, NFTs, blockchain tech as a whole, and now, you know, the metaverse. So very excited to talk about it and, uh, you know, what the potential is. Oh, uh, we, we can't hear you. Sorry, guys, just cutting out the background noise. Ed, let's kick it over to you and get a little bit of background on you and your projects uh, before we launch in. So, Ed, uh, a squirty or some frog in the space. Um, Frogland is what we're presently building. Um, New Pangea is the name of the metaverse with themed districts after the PFPs that will inhabit them. Uh, personally, my background has come from nearly a decade in hardware and software development in the virtual reality space, uh, building products and prototypes to companies like Samsung and NVIDIA and Mattel. Um, I was quite fortunate to be able to discuss the future of the metaverse with members such as the author of Ready Player One and the founder of Oculus many, many years ago, and have continued to, to work as what I like to consider somewhat of a thought leader in the space. So with Frogland, what we realized is after spending nearly a decade uh, for raising institutional capital and doing some fundraising for hardware and software development, we saw a new trend in the NFT space. We have artists wanting to spend in our knowledge space. So with that, we realize there's a new momentum here that we can uh, effectively bootstrap the development of a new metaverse by working directly with the community of people that will use it. And with that, we, we, we came up with the idea of New Pangea. So uh, Frogland is a generative series that we've now sold out. Each frog comes with a plot of land in a metaverse, um, and it is a gamified space uh, with partnerships with people such as the Guttercat Gang and the Wicked Craniums to provide a a space that has the same look and feel after the very famous, very popular PFP projects out there. So I'm sure we can dig into a little bit more, but ultimately waiting for NFTs, and waiting for the metaverse, and waiting for VR for nearly a decade, and finally we see it coming. Beautiful. Uh, one thing I'd like to lay a foundation here um, when we're talking about metaverse, uh, virtual reality, uh, one thing that's becoming uh, more and more apparent to me is <clears throat> oftentimes augmented reality 
and virtual reality can get lumped together. Um, but you know, folks maybe in each of those spaces may maybe like, hey, that's not exactly what I'm doing. Um, so I'm curious if if you folks have any opinions about sort of what's the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality? Um, and do they intersect? How so? And you know, what can we do? What does it have to do with the metaverse? So um, I don't know if there's a clear answer, but uh, let's start with you, Ed. Um, what's the difference between augmented and virtual reality? Okay, so virtual reality, think of a ski mask that you are isolated inside an entirely virtual space with a very wide field of view. So effectively everything you can see is a big, beautiful 3D virtual world. Augmented reality, however, is not quite changing and providing a new reality. It's augmenting, it's changing the reality that you can see. Generally with glasses such as the Tilt 5 or the Epson Mavario or HoloLens or magically, the number of, of AR devices out there. Main limitations, of course, is what's called the field of view, having a very small area of the world that is actually augmented. And so effectively, not everything you see will be as, as wonderful as you may expect it to be with these AR glasses. It may just be a very small percentage of what you can actually see. So it's not as immersive as virtual reality, but it's a lot more user friendly because of course, you can still see the world around you. You can still see mum and dad in your hands and individuals. So it's not as isolating as virtual reality is. And ultimately, augmented reality is gonna be a hundred fold as big as any virtual reality will ever be. I see VR in the industry effectively like PC gaming relative to mobile gaming. I see AR will become the replacement for your mobile phones and your tablets. Uh, P uh, VR will always be something used for location-based entertainment, for, for high-end gaming um, with dedicated hardware. Uh, AR is awesome, VR even more so. Um, that being said, when a metaverse comes into it, a metaverse is really simply a fancy word for an online shared persistent space. It's a, it's a video game that is online all the time, able for anyone to jump in. Really. It's, it's a three-dimensional internet is one way of thinking about it. So virtual and augmented realities are simply windows by which you can experience those metaverses. So you can play a metaverse on a 2D screen, but you could also put a VR headset on or a pair of augmented reality glasses to have a more immersive and intuitive uh, feel of the, the metaverse itself, if that kind of answers the question. Yeah, great, great answer. Um, and you got a lot of the foundational elements. Appreciate you going to the basics a little bit there. Um, and, and I'll just ask another basic question before we get a more full opinion um, from, from Dan. Uh, are we in a metaverse like right now? <laughs> this is also a piece of things, right? You know, we're in a virtual chat. And none of us is in the same physical space. Uh, does this count? <laughs> do, you know, does this count as a metaverse or, you know, should we just call it something else? I'm, I'm curious, Dan, what do you think? Are we in a metaverse right now with this chat that we're doing? I don't think so. Uh, you know, I, I think that the most exciting thing about the metaverse is you ask 100 people what a metaverse is, you'll get 100 different answers. Um, so that's what makes it most exciting. It's something new. It's not something that's really been developed to its potential. So that's the great thing is you have so many different things that can be brought uh, to fruition right now, uh, many things we haven't even considered really in the public in the public mind. So I think that's what makes it you know the most compelling thing about you know the metaverse being developed now. And it's I think it's only because we have this confluence of all these technologies. Uh, you know you have blockchain, you have the hardware tech, you have the processing power, graphics, and we've 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 kind of uh, come to this juncture where all this technology is exist to a high enough degree where it could actually make a metaverse work. So, um, yeah, I think that's great. And I do agree with Ethan about AR being way bigger than VR. You know, just by nature, AR is going to be a lot easier for the common person to use. Um, it could be just glasses that displays overlays of, you know, what you see in, in everyday life. And, you know, um, it's had it's had applications in the military and different you know very niche areas of life, but I think if you think about how it could be applied in everyday life now, um, it's just amazing. Imagine you know opening the hood of your car to fix it, and you see an AR overlay of what you need to do to fix your vehicle, right? So, I think AR AR is most exciting to me. Uh, VR mm -hmm. obviously is very exciting, and they both have their you know their own functions and their own uh, benefits. So, you know, they're two different texts. They're two different texts and they right. both serve their own purpose. Yeah. Yep, thanks for that. And I think it's Ed, not, not me, but Ed said that maybe uh, AR would be bigger, bigger than VR. Um, Ed, that's right. But, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stick with you. And again, I'm asking kind of basic questions here, but they're ones that have come up in our podcast. And, 
you know, once they come up, you're like, oh, yeah, it, that, that is sort of something I didn't consider. Um, what about the idea of like the metaverse, right, versus multiple metaverses, right? Like, you know, is the metaverse the metaverse, right? Or is it just uh, a million metaverses? And how many metaverses are there going to be, you know, if there are a million metaverses? What are your thoughts on the sort of uh, fractalization of metaverse technology, Dan, Daniel? Yeah, I think, I mean, I view it like the internet. So right when the internet first started, you have maybe, you know, a handful of websites, and now you have millions of websites. So with the metaverse, I think it's the same thing. Uh, you know, given metaverses are way more complicated than websites, you know, you're going to have a few prominent players that have their own metaverses, and you'll see interoperability. So I don't think it's going to be about, you know, uh, that question specifically. It's going to be more about how do all these metaverses interoper how are they interoperable? How do they function? And then, you know, obviously some metaverses will be will be specialized for certain certain fields and other metaverses will do other things better. So um, until all the technology and all the development reaches a certain, you know, peak, you're, you're kind of going to see like uh, different specializations, different niches. And then, you know, gradually, I think it'll build up to where they have uh, common uh, features in common, you know, ability. Yeah, it, it almost seems like we might move towards the type of interoperability we have between, you know, Android and, and uh, you know, Mac products or something like that. Okay, there might be some, there, there might, might uh, be parts where you can't, there might be sort of universal, universalization of standards, right? Um, I think that's one thing that's interesting that we're seeing with NFTs is, right, people I want to create digital items, but wouldn't it be cool if I can have that digital item not just within one, you know, game or metaverse? What if I could carry it uh, between multiple? And um, I, I guess uh, Ed, uh, that's maybe a bit of what you're going for with Frogland, right? Because you have integrated a number of different PFP projects into what it means to be, you know, a citizen of Frogland. So can you talk a little bit about? you know, interoperability of, of metaverse and digital, you know, yeah. NFT items? Yeah, it's a great question. And ultimately, I, so I agree with Daniel, the, the idea of a metaverse, you know, it's, um, it's one online shared persistent space. Without any one of those pillars, you do not have a metaverse. It must be online, must be shared, must be persistent. So effectively, this idea of um, many different metaverses, I don't think is ultimately the case. I, I still think we don't actually have a real metaverse today. Because again, it doesn't quite clap, uh, we don't quite have the, the unified standards that developers can embrace to be able to build what would effectively look like a portal, but act like a hyperlink to take you from one experience to another. So that ultimately is, I think, the direction we should be heading down as a technical community to see a metaverse come to fruition. It, no one company owns the internet, much like no one company will own the metaverse. It is a concept, it is an idea. So effectively being able to plug in many different spaces to this one online shared persistent space is going to get us closer to the idea of a metaverse. So with Frogland, we realized that. We saw a lot of interest in the idea of spending time in a shared persistent space. We saw the interest generated from PFPs, from avatar projects. And, and so we saw the metaverses that were out there didn't necessarily take into account the aesthetics and the look and the feel for the artwork that people love so much that they're willing to spend so much money on. So we felt it was needed that those PFP projects deserved a, a, a district, a zone, if you will, that looks like their, their, their aesthetic. Um, and as such, that shouldn't be an isolated walled garden. That should be in a space where one could be free to move from one district to another. So this is the premise of what we're doing with Frogland. The idea being frogs are the owners of the land in the centralmost district, but we built a model that allows us to introduce communities at the, the behest of our community, to, which would further add narrative, law, gameplay, but ultimately brings new communities into the same online shared persistent space. With a view that at a later stage, we'd like to open up these standards so that other people will simply be able to build in modules. Now, the, the idea is building something in a collaborative uh, idea, uh, in a collaborative way with Frogland. So ultimately, to be able to embrace the, uh, the tools that developers already know and love that are open and standardized, that is gonna help us get to that, uh, that goal that much easier. Yeah, that's cool. It, it makes me it reminds me of when I lived in Brooklyn, New York, right? I mean, uh, 
you know, you can be in the hipster neighborhood, you can be in the like Hasidic Jewish neighborhood, <laughs> you know, you can be in that like a uh, Manhattan professional, you know, with with two kids and and a brownstone uh, neighborhood, right? And um, they have different aesthetics, right? But I, you know, if you live in one, you can go to the other and you know, sort of play in that in that domain and and experience that culture. And then I guess what's really cool about uh, just the, extending the metaphor, you know, a city like uh, New York and, and Brooklyn is just the incredible, you know, outgrowth of creativity that comes from all of these things, you know, coming together in the same place. Um, so that sounds exciting. Um, D Daniel, let's let's go to you for sort of the next topic. Mm -hmm. um, s see if you can say, uh, you know, you have anything uh, valuable to contribute. Um, decentralized metaverses versus centralized is that are, does that exist you know is that a topic that you think about um are most metaverses by nature centralized because you have to have um you know a, a centralized group of people building it yeah i mean that's open to interpretation right just like with blockchain you have some blockchains that are centralized some that are decentralized and just because i think just because it's centralized, a metaverse is centralized or uncentralized, I don't think, you know, it really would define whether it's a true metaverse or not. Um, you'll have both. You'll have decentralized metaverses and centralized metaverses. And yeah, just like blockchain tech, basically. Now, what about, um, you know, what excites you about integrating uh, blockchain technology with metaverse technology is there something magical about these two or is just another two things that you compare together and it has to be you know your area of interest what what brings something special between blockchain and metaverse yeah so i think blockchain is the perfect technology that really allows um basically something that's immutable something that's you know always going to be there cannot be cannot be really, you know, tampered by a central authority. Again, it depends on the blockchain, but for the most part. Um, and it, it really just gives uh, people the ability to own, to own things in the metaverse, right? So I guess this goes to NFTs. Like a lot of people talk about, you know, NFTs relating to art. That's how 99% of people, you know, talk about NFTs right now. But uh, I think in the next year or two or three, NFTs will be in everything. You're talking about physical products. You're talking about everything, right? You go shopping, uh, you buy something. It's going to be, it's going to have an NFT tied to it via barcode or some other mechanism. And then, you know, you have the perfect uh, record of, uh, of the purchase. You have warranty information, you know, you have ownership history. You know, and think about it, apply it to, you know, cars, vehicles, uh, clothing, uh, houses even, right? And obviously, there's a lot of work to get all that stuff integrated. But, um, you know, it's really the perfect tech. And like I said before, we're really at the right time where we have all these technologies lining up. And um, yeah, great time to be alive. Yeah, yeah, things definitely are coming together naturally um, in very interesting ways. Um, yeah, anything from you, Ed, on just you know why <laughs> blockchain and metaverse go together uh, so well, or whether they do or not? No, they, they categorically do. And in fact, one of the main reasons for Vitalik building Ethereum in the first place was after World of Warcraft removed one of the characters, he spent all so long building up, developing, right. and then growing. Now, this whole idea of using blockchain technology, it's not just the combination of two fancy buzzwords. This is really impressive tech that, as Daniel highlighted, can prove ownership. So effectively, you buy an NFT, an avatar, a, a, a 3D model in some shape or form, that belongs to you. Now, regardless of which system you may want to import that into, the idea that that can never be removed from you, that is your IP, your ownership, I think, is incredibly important. The whole idea, I mean, the game development space would have laughed immensely five, 10 years ago to talk, to talk about spending thousands of dollars on skins inside a game, and yet Fortnite is making $30 million a week simply selling skins. I mean, it's, it's serious money. So the idea that a, a centralized company could just flick a switch and take those skins away from you is not a nice idea. So with the integration of blockchain technology, you remove that risk. 
as and when people start buying their skins and their avatars and their 3D models inside games in an NFT capacity that will remain in their wallet, doesn't matter what happens to the companies making the games you maybe play those avatars in at the moment. They could die, they could live, doesn't matter. You still own your 3D model. And I think that's such an important thing for ownership in a metaverse that people shouldn't sort of overlook. Um, so yeah, definitely not just the combination of a bunch of buzzwords, really, really impactful stuff. Yeah, and maybe piggybacking on this idea of ownership in the metaverse. Um, I remember we had you on the podcast uh, several, I think it was a few months ago at this point, everything changes so quickly, who knows? <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and you had this phrase, buy frog, get land, you know, which is interesting. I don't know that that had been done before in terms of you get a character, but then you also almost get like a digital land title. Um, uh, you know, let me know if you if you had seen that before, or, or you feel like that was an original idea that you had a, a character that gets attached to land, and it's sort of the thought process like why why did you decide to do it that way as opposed to just saying buy land get frog or you know I don't know. No, it's, yeah. it's it's a very it's a very good question. Now, ultimately, what we've done with Frogland. Um, it's ultimately focused on building community of individuals we want as our virtual neighbors in a new space that we're developing. So mm -hmm. touching upon this co-creation of narrative, of utility and of design with some of the smartest, most intelligent and most creative individuals in this space has been nothing short of a thing of beauty. We've seen some wonderful things happen that we never even anticipated ourselves simply because very cool people have gotten together under the idea of, hey, let's build some cool stuff. So this whole idea of buy frog, get land, after seeing what happened with the Bored Ape Yacht Club, with the Bored Apes buying a lot of land in Sandbox and then their community buying even more land around them, um, we saw a, a new metaverse was needed, something that took into account the gamified style, the debaucherous nature of these PFPs. And so we realized, right, let's, let's ensure that the community of like-minded individuals even exists before we go and spend the millions of dollars needed to go and develop a space like this. Now, having come from a decade of raising money for hardware and software companies before pivoting into the NFT space, it's no fun. Uh, it takes a lot, it's time consuming, it's expensive. Uh, you've got a lot of business plans. You've got to, you can't focus on the fun tech. Now with Frogland, we saw an interesting way where we can ensure we even have a community that wants the same product that we want to build. And those individuals are members that would be able to contribute in the development and the ideas and the thought process behind it all. So rather than going to pitch a bunch of stuffy board execs who probably would never play this game in the first place, we realized let's just talk to the community of people we know and love. And through going to real life events for a few short months, we managed to get in touch with some of the biggest names in the space. I mean, you, you, check, you check the wallets that you'll find frogs inside of, and you'll see some fairly interesting people there who we know personally, having gone to a lot of these IRL spaces, both in Venice and in New York. So this idea of buy frog, get land was more an idea to bring together a community before the product. And I feel this is a much better way because ultimately, why should we design anything in stealth when we should do everything in transparency with the people that will ultimately be using this? So you're right, it's not a model we had seen previously, but it's certainly a model we hope others follow as a way to bootstrap and to develop what it is they're trying to build here. Yeah, so, yeah that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. The, the, it, I see that aspect of like the land is not just land, it's attached to a community, right? And, and, and the community is behind land. So why not have there be like sort of personalities behind the individuals uh, within that community and, and have a way for them to build that community um, before the metaverse even emerges? Um, this is a great segue um, into talking about, Daniel, some of your background. You, you've worked with, in real estate, if, if I'm correct. And I'm just curious, like, <laughs> number one, as someone who's been in real estate and you get into metaverses, do you abandon real estate and say, oh, I'm in metaverse real estate now? <laughs> um, you continue to operate in, like, uh, in, in real estate in the sort of quote unquote real world. And just like, yeah, how are these things connected, disconnected? What's the relationship? And, uh, and uh, what's your dog's name? <laughs> we see good question. I walk it. Good I love when dogs make guest appearances. <laughs> this is a uh, this is baby. Oh, uh, baby! Hello, baby. <laughs> no. All right. Yeah. But, anyways, um, we can return to the question at hand. Tell me. Yeah. About real estate so. And yeah, I mean, real estate is great, right? Um, and I don't think it's about transitioning from real real estate to virtual real estate. I think pretty soon, we'll actually have um, we'll actually have you know the tying together of, of virtual real estate and real real estate. So, you know, obviously, obviously it's a brand new, brand new area and, you know, that's what makes it exciting. Right. So I think similarly, you have, you have some common traits in virtual real estate and real real estate. You have scarcity. 
uh, in most projects. And that's something we have in network. So in network, we have 15,000 parcels total, and uh, which is uh, lower than, I guess, to Centerland is somewhere around 100,000. And yeah, yeah, in the last month and a half or so, we've sold about $17 million worth of NFTs. So we're very happy about that. We exceeded our expectations. And um, I think it really shows there's a demand for this virtual real estate. Um, so I think people see the metaverse as being this life-changing technology, just like the internet uh, was when it first came out. And they want to they want a part of it. They want to be part of it. They want to own a piece of it, you know, have some skin in the game. And what better way than owning virtual real estate, you know? And mm -hmm. part of our focus uh, at Network is to create a true metaverse that's multi-blockchain. Uh, we're focused on eight blockchains initially that will have full support in the metaverse. And, you know, we're focused on business, e-commerce, education, as well as uh, gaming and socializing. So we're really, we've really sought out to create a true metaverse uh, that really encumps, uh, encapsulates all the things that people want to do um, and really has that utility that we haven't seen in the metaverse, uh, you know, just yet. So, so tell us about, um, you have a token that can be spent within the metaverse. Is this something mm -hmm. that um, is just within your metaverse or is that cross, you know, metaverse? You know, w w tell us about the, the token and tokenomics and how, how you're handling that. Yeah, so we have the network token, which is our native token. Uh, there's 100 million in circulation uh, right now. Market cap somewhere around 180 million. Um, so yeah, you use network tokens to buy things off the network marketplace, and you could also use them to mint assets in our creation engine. And basically, what that is is it allows anyone to create assets or games or experiences inside of our metaverse without having to know any Unity coding or Unreal Engine coding. Basically, you know, we liken ourselves to be the YouTube of the metaverse, giving people the tools to create their own content and then monetize that content via NFTs. And it's something that can also be deployed on their virtual land. And we have some really uh, great partners. We have over 80 currently that are uh, building in the metaverse. And, you know, this includes crypto companies and real world companies, real brands. So we're, we're very excited about that. Fascinating stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I guess um, I want to take it to another topic. We'll, we'll take it over to Ed. Um, if you had anything to say in what we were talking about, interested to hear it. But w one thing I wanted to share, which that was uh, just an interesting thought I had as we're talking about, you know, real estate, the digital world. Um, one of the first things that helped me understand digital real estate and its connection with, you know, real real estate is, you know, location, quote unquote, is important. And why is location important? Because it, it sort of matters, like, who's around that? Like, where's the foot traffic? You know, where's the attention? If I might pay an exorbitant amount for, um, you know, a storefront in Times Square, for example, that maybe isn't even a profitable location, um, just because there's a ton of foot traffic, and it's really going to do something special for my brand. Um, and if you think about like real estate that way, right, and you connect it to the virtual world, you can also almost even think of people's you know, Instagram profiles is a form of virtual real estate, right? Because the eyeballs are there, you know, the traffic is there, the engagement is there, and it, it's a, it sort of becomes a place for people to interact. Um, but yeah, Ed, Ed, I'll turn it over to you and just thoughts about connections between real real estate, virtual real estate, you know, tokenomics, things like that. You know, I just love to hear what you have uh, as far as thoughts on this stuff. Yeah, I mean, location, location, location. It's as important in the metaverse as it is in the real world. So this whole idea of watching these spaces grow and then watching projects and partnerships evolve inside them that then greatly increases the value of the land around it is a really fascinating concept. Um, and one that we embrace wholeheartedly with Frogland where we've realized the, the frog holders, the people who receive a plot of land in this central most district, um, will effectively be the ones that will benefit the most from the, the evolution of this space. Because, of course, while we have strong land in the center, we have the Guttercat Gang to the west, we have the Isla de Vossius, uh, the Wiki Cranium to the south, we have an exposition district with some of the biggest independent artists who want to be demonstrating their own artwork in a more independently themed gallery, and we have an unannounced partner off to the, uh, to, the, to the west. So the whole idea that 
we are the founding frogs in a centralmost district that will grow with community. And what I mean by that is at a future point in time, our, our community will vote on which projects to join next. And so this will continue to build up around the centralmost district. And I feel this is a, a, an innovative way that allows us to reward our earliest supporters for the duration that this metaverse will continue to be built, both with enjoyable and engaging free content, almost like DLC, by bringing on new projects, new narratives, new map packs, new storylines, but ultimately by increasing the value of their land as this centralized district becomes more and more attractive because ultimately it is dead center of the map. So this is New Pangaea, the, the new land rising out of the waters, with frogs, of course, being the first creatures to evolve out of the, out of the, the depths. We feel this is a, a new world that's evolving. And as such, we can take what we like from the real world and we can start improving on what we didn't like from the real world in this virtual space. Um, but absolutely, we've seen so many similar, similarities between the real real estate world and the virtual real estate world. It's, it's quite fascinating. Cool. Yeah. And you, and you touched upon this topic of kind of incentivization, you know, when you talked about rewarding early adopters, um, rewarding community engagement, all of these things. Um, I'd love to talk uh, amongst us a little bit and I'll, I'll go to you, Ed, first about this idea of incentivization, you know, what makes for good incentivization, um, how we create these structures. Um, I know you have a very uh, active Discord channel, uh, for example, and, and there's, it's structured in such a way where people get rewarded, you know, for engagement or for participation or, you know, for holding frogs, right, or something like that. So um, talk, talk to us a, a little bit about incentives and how your team has tackled, you know, creating incentive structures that are functional. So I think our, our project may be slightly different from, from a lot, um, because when it came to incentivizations, you know, we, I don't think we've even held any, any Frogland giveaways within our Discord server yet. Uh, we've, we've been very careful to curate a space of individuals who understand we're building a metaverse, and as such, that is a time process, and that is a fairly big task to do. And so as far as incentivization, people realize by owning a frog, not only they get a plot of land in a metaverse, but they also get a say in the development process. So we started to see gangs evolving. For instance, the Naked Frogs is a, a band of individuals who've, uh, who've realized that they, the frogs without any clothing at all could potentially be quite interesting in the metaverse um, at a future point in time. So they started developing this law, the idea that they spent a long time from the hot springs and they have really started digging into some fascinating backstory, which is all now being written into the official law of New Pangaea. So as a space filled with gamers and game developers, now to be able to contribute in some shape or form to build the narrative, the, the setting, the, the utility of a space that they're ultimately going to be a big part of as central landholders, I feel this is better incentivization than anything else. I like to say Frogland is an exclusive club that anyone's welcome to join because we have a running joke that you don't rib it about Frogland because we know this space is big enough for us to curate an audience of individuals that we want as our virtual neighbors that are gonna propel this space into being something we've never seen before. But ultimately, we do this together. And so in terms of incentivization, yeah, I mean, obviously, we can do giveaways and these sorts of things at a later point in time. But we feel that simply creating an entirely new space that is built by a community for a community is the most fascinating thing. And through that, the connections we meet, the people we get to talk to and work with has been nothing short of, of, of awesome. Yeah, I see a theme here, and it's come up a few times during this this conference and, and, and recent talks, and it's like, uh, when, from the outside, uh, some of these projects seem ex there's exclusive exclusivity involved, right? Like I own an ape, you know, you don't own an ape, right? I, I own this, you know, profile pick project, you don't stuff like that, right? Um, but I think what you're highlighting that's interesting about it that may not be obvious at first blush is that um, a lot of times uh, the ex exclusivity is commensurate with engagement, participation, and co-creation, right? And, and then when it comes down to that, like you said, anybody's welcome, you know, and, and you can be a part of this group, but it'd be a part of this group would kind of like you to participate and co-create, right? And then that's how, how you become, you be part of something that's exclusive, right? Precisely. We've had so many members of our Discord who've been elevated through to, to the ranks of, of, of Discord members, to paid members of staff working with us now. And this is because we embrace the community that, that is effectively building up what we're building. Um, so if there's anyone who's passionate about game development, content creation, blockchain, solidity, we have some experts here who are really willing to help share their knowledge and simply come, and, even if you don't have a frog, you can still hop into the Discord and still spend time and learn about the project because we took an anti-FOMO launch. We spent nothing on marketing. We went to real life events and we provided a lot of friction to whiteless individuals to ensure those individuals joining were people serious about what we're building. 
And so it's been a very novel way of doing things, but nonetheless, I feel it will add to a great deal of community value over the next week, few months, few years, as we continue to develop this into being something really quite tremendous. Cool. Um, da Daniel, uh, what are your thoughts on incentivization and, and um, how, how you've attempted to kind of create the right incentives around uh, your metaverse project? Yeah, so I think the most you know fascinating thing is once the metaverse is live is how companies and corporations will be incentivizing users to do specific tasks or specific things for rewards, right? Um, you know, which kind of sounds a little bit dystopian, right? Uh, you have you have like Facebook entering the space and can only imagine what their plans are for the metaverse, right? <laughs> I saw Ed shake his head. No. <laughs> yeah, we could. <laughs> Not we, a good we, idea. We could definitely right? take some yeah. uh, Facebook bashing moments here. We have plenty of time for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why not? But uh, basically, I think you know that's the whole name of the game. Uh, people go to work to be rewarded with a paycheck. So the metaverse is really an extension of that, where people will, can be rewarded by other people or companies to do specific things or create things. So. You know, having this monet monetization ability for people to create assets in the metaverse, you know, games, experiences, and then, you know, charge for that and make money. Um, yeah, I think that's it's going to be I think it's going to be one of the biggest segments of the economy in the next few years is people working in a metaverse uh, environment, you know, in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. So we're, right. we're just focused on the big picture and how how that's really going to you know, happen, you know, there's so many, so many things to consider. Yeah, this is a great topic, too. And and I think we should dive into it a little bit on um, the sort of like, uh, ways that these metaverses can, you know, engage, you know, global audiences and, and change, you know, societal structures in a way. Um, but first, let's talk about Facebook a little bit. <laughs> because you brought it up. Um, I, I I, I feel like the pattern that I've seen among among some of the folks that are more deep into crypto and NFTs is it's kind of like, oh, what Facebook? Oh, okay. Oh, they're oh they're in Meta. Okay, okay, sure. You know, and like maybe they're not paying too close attention. That's a little bit of my experience. There's so many fascinating things that have been going on that we've been learning about. Uh, I wasn't even really aware that Facebook was going in that direction. Um, we don't really know, um, you know, how deep you know, and how long lasting this plan is, but I'd love to get your guys' opinion um, just just as it's an interesting conversation topic about, you know, Facebook announcing um, this change of brand and, and this direction and, and where you think it, it's going to go. Um, uh, you, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. It's a, it's a good question and one I think that needs asking. Um, now, I remember back in 2013, 2014, mainly because it was only Palmer Lucky and myself demonstrating virtual reality hardware in those early days. We had Palmer Lucky who built the company Oculus that had a headset that would plug into a PC. And we had my company that built a headset with the computer built inside of it, the first self-contained VR headset, powered by NVIDIA technology rather than Qualcomm. Now, the idea of this tech is wonderful. A metaverse is meant to be an anonymous space, much like the internet can be an anonymous space. Now, we watched in 2014, 2015, when Oculus grew and Facebook acquired Oculus, and we watched Facebook make the promise that you'll never need an Oculus login account, to, to a Facebook account, rather, to log into your, your Oculus technology, which is quite a concern if you did need that, because, of course, the amount of bit analytical information you can derive from a virtual reality headset is absolutely terrifying. Um, mm. people, we, as a, uh, companies can establish who is using a headset within moments of them putting a headset on based purely on the movements that they're taking. So... Ultimately, to monetize data, you need to know whose data it is, what demographic it belongs to. So the moment Facebook then announced that you would, in fact, need an Oculus login account to access your virtual reality hardware, that was a very scary moment for me, um, and mm. one that I was really quite, quite alarmed by. Um, I think we've seen a number of things transpire with Oculus's life cycle over the past few years. Um, and I think the idea of a rebrand to Meta could be an idea to hopefully, uh, maybe people won't remember about all of that stuff, which is terrifying because ultimately, we're moving into an Orwellian future where Facebook where companies are using cameras to track individuals, be it their movements, be it edge detection, be it their rooms, be it anything at all. And as we start to see the evolution of what's called eye tracking, when you can monitor the, the every circade of the pupil moving, but for some child, so it's, you know, what are they looking at for how long? And I mean, this is just a world that is 
it's just a world we do not want to, to run into. But nonetheless, unfortunately, this is the world that started to, to, to be built in 2014 when, mm -hmm. when individuals who love technology would give away the privacy and the data for a shiny new piece of tech. But I think with NFTs, we're now seeing a more sophisticated audience of individuals who care about their data enough to not freely give it away for a shiny new piece of tech. And I know this because I've had artists who will refuse to send me artwork over email because of the, the, the larger corporations, and instead they will mail me a USB stick. So I think with this new idea of a metaverse, we're going to see Facebook create something that's going to effectively recreate a version of reality, which is fine. But I think what really a metaverse should be doing is giving you that escape from reality, giving you that different world where you couldn't just experience that same thing somewhere else in reality. So this is what we're trying to do with Frogland. It's effectively build something that is an escape from reality. They're 1920s debaucherous gangster frogs. You know, they, they like to have fun. They like to get messed up. They like to have fun with each other. And it's, it's a change from the world that we've all experienced where we've been locked in COVID style for the past two years. So I think it's, look, I want everyone to do well in this space, but I certainly want the artists and the content creators to gravitate towards decentralized solutions that will actually care about data privacy or at least allow the end user to monetize their own data. Um, we've seen blockchain bring this about, like Brave Attention Browser, uh, the BAT token. It's one an incredible token where users can now monetize their own attention. They can choose to not see any ads or they could choose to see ads. And if they see ads, then they will get paid for those adverts. And I think this mm -hmm. is a great trend that crypto introduces that I think metaverses should take that as a standard. I think that is something that data will be derived and users should be paid for that data. So I'm just going to throw that out there. I could talk about this all day. So <laughs> all right. Yeah. No, I very much appreciate uh, your candor and your opinion because you know it, it. Also, like like you said, you have you have an inside look. You know, sort of no pun pun intended, right? In the in the space and what's going on and what what are the capacities and capabilities. You know, I know. Um, it's very interesting to see. Um, I mean, I, I I'm often told I'm, I'm I'm I look younger than than I am, right? I'm in my 40s here, so I I uh, I experience like a different uh, stage of of technology. Um, I'm basically like you know Mark Zuckerberg's peer. I think we're around the same age and and everything. And um, it's interesting to see the next generation of people that are you know early 20s, under 20. Um, it's, it's actually kind of cool to see them, you know, care more about privacy and care more about decentralization and care about this stuff. I, I remember when Facebook emerged, I did, I just didn't feel right about it, you know? And of course, just like you said, there was no login, you know, they weren't going to have some login for, um, for o Oculus to connect you to Facebook. Um, at, at the same time, if we all remember, Facebook was totally ad free when it started. And, and that was kind of what brought people to the platform, right? And I was like, oh, MySpace has ads, you know, I want to do the ad free one. And there's almost this air of like, they're doing that because they want to help you out <laughs> without the ads, you know? And now we see it, it's just turned into like this free for all, you know, where um, it, it literally, I don't know what else I can say. It's that's free -for -all. Yeah, that's right? a great point. Yeah, I think this probably makes one of the most interesting conversations about the metaverse is you know, bringing Facebook into the equation for so many reasons, right? Um, somebody was joking the other day, yeah, you enter uh, Mark Zuckerberg's or Facebook's uh, metaverse and, you know, it steals all your information and <laughs> starts. <laughs> but, you know, just kind of like zooming out for a second, right? Um, you know, like you, I never got into Facebook when it came out. I kind of felt, you know, funny about it. And, you know, we were proven right. Um, having a model of, you know, selling people's information, you know, it's horrible. Um, so I, I don't know if I share the same optimism of, you know, people are really kind of wise to it these days. You still have an a, amazing amount of people using Facebook to this day, and they know, you know, it's common knowledge that they sell your information. So a lot of people just don't care or, you know, it's just not one of their concerns. So you know, I like to be optimistic that people are, are moving in that direction. But, you know, I guess we'll see. What was that? Uh, yeah, Ed? I was thinking, I agree. People in, 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 in totality, absolutely. They will use Facebook and continue to use it for a while. But I think the NFT content creators are the ones that do care. And I think look, there's a saying, content is king. And this is so true, especially in NFTs, in emerging technology. VR never had the support of the content creators. Uh, when Oculus was beginning to, they alienated a lot of the core devs by what we just spoke about. So I think what we're seeing with NFTs is this, this 
reluctance to embrace what is already out there and searching for something new, which is why these content creators have found NFTs in the first place. So I think it's those individuals who will be less likely to simply blindly adopt new technology because they understand the complexities of it. I agree though, everyone else, they're screwed. They're gonna to continue to use the product up until there is something better out there. But the only right. way there will be something better out there is by getting those content creators to build the content for this better thing, at which point everyone else will flock across. So I agree, but I'm hoping, I'm, I'm an optimist at the end of the day, fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, like like the point you were making about, you know, Oculus, Facebook buys Oculus, and then you have to use Facebook login now to use Oculus. You know, pretty soon you're going to have a retinal scan when you put on Oculus, and it's going to identify you by retina. And that's really scary to me. I don't want, you know, anyone having my personal retina uh, profile or anything like that. I don't think anyone does. So it's really, I feel like, you know, companies that are that big, like Google and Facebook, are basically looking for these ways to get a big portion of the population into their systems, right? And then you're going to have independent systems uh, that don't really subscribe to that same, you know, model. And I hope that most people will will steer towards these independent models that, you know, don't think the same way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, one interesting thing about uh, just sort of the rise in popular interest of, of NFTs to the general public, sort of this raising of awareness is that when you create something, you know, be it a, be it a, uh, just a, what people might consider, oh, it's just a minor thing, like a Facebook post or, or an Instagram post or something like that, like, <clears throat> that could be yours, right? Like, that's yours. You, you created that. You made that. And I remember that was one of the early things that turned me off from Facebook, right? It was like, hey, look at those terms of service, right? I don't remember the exact language, but I'm assuming it was something like, you know, you put your photo on Facebook and, you know, by nature of, of facilitating the platform, but also in a very scary way, it's like, we have a license now to profit off of your content because you posted it on Facebook, right? And it, it's, it, I think because people know about NFTs is becoming a more, more common knowledge of what it is and that it signifies ownership, um, you know, having some language in a contract that says, you know, we also get to profit off of your non-fungible tokens, off of your N NFTs. Like, I feel like people um, might, might, have, there might be more awareness around that like oh hey like this is my I, I want to retain ownership i want to have some more say in the licensing of it maybe i'm wrong right <laughs> but um it, it's interesting that we're drawing attention to this in our popular culture yeah moving to a better world fingers crossed i i've 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 hoped that uh, that together we could build something better um and we're yeah if we always if we always just accept what's what's shoveled in front of us which we're rude, but hopefully we can band together and do something better I agree. Yeah. I agree, guys. I mean, one interesting thing that we've seen is like the music industry, right? And the music industry is notorious for being unfair to artists. And, you know, with the advent of the internet, we saw Napster, we saw all these different technologies. And it just kind of boggles my mind that, you know, here we are in 2021, and we still don't have like a very uh, robust music publishing system that's, you know, really fair to artists. So, you know, I think you have such a amalgamation of all these different powers. You have the, you know, the old guard, you have the, all these industries that want to retain power. Um, so, yeah, you have, you have people like, like Ed and myself and, you know, Network and Frogland. We're trying to do something that's, you know, a vision of fairness, a vision of independence. And then you, you do have these big corporations that are, are trying to claw at the last, uh, you know, amount of power they have in this so yeah yeah it remains to be seen but actually that's a great topic for maybe um the last little bit as we wrap up here um in the last 10 minutes five or 10 minutes or so what's next right um in, in metaverses uh, what do you guys see down the line are there other projects that you're excited about are there trends um that you're watching out for um let us know uh ed why don't we turn it over to you what's next in metaverses in metaverses in general, um, again, yeah. I, I'd like or, to say, and, and Frogland. <laughs> <laughs> well, in metaverses in general, I'd like to say, as I mentioned, unified standards that are already embraced by developers, so that everyone out there can build their own, for lack of a better word, three D website, because that ultimately is what these metaverses should be. 
user created content that's able to be sort of teleported from one to another. So that is what I'd like to see for the metaverse creation. Um, as for Frogland, we are well on the way with the work. And in fact, we recently tweeted some some uh, some work from the game development studio um, building this platform, which is just for a bit of a reminder, um, is the entire management team from Sony's flagship London studio. In fact, the team that built a lot of Sony's best selling launch VR content and games like Wipeout or The Getaway. Um, working with some incredible blockchain engineers that we know, and in fact, I think most of the founding team from Frogland came from Rare Pizzas, uh, so we have a, a good experience when it comes to the blockchain and the NFT side. So this this idea that the game development process is now being undertaken by these world class game developers, and we have these Hollywood creative directors building the narrative and the storyline, we've been releasing this through various channels in our Discord for community feedback and input. So we will continue down this vein um, up until we have uh, demonstrable playable content over the next few weeks. Um, and ultimately, yeah, quite a, quite excited by it all. But uh, we're building a metaverse here, so we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> cool. And Daniel, what do you see uh, both in the uh, future of network and uh, and metaverses in general? What should we watch out for? Yeah. So I mean, again, I think it's about utility. Uh, everybody wants to do things in the metaverse that you know increase the value of what they're doing. They don't want to just be in the metaverse for the sake of being in the metaverse, right? So as long as as long as the utility is there, uh, I think, you know, I think we're headed in the right direction. So that's why in network we focused on, you know, not just games and, you know, socializing, which are great, right? Don't get me wrong. But we worked very, very diligently to incorporate uh, business, e-commerce, right? And I think the metaverse is the next big leap for e-commerce. You have blockchain technology, you have NFTs. So in network, uh, you know, it's what we call e-commerce 2.0. Um, and we have NFTs tied to physical products. We have the, the beautiful Unreal Engine. Uh, we're transitioning to Unreal Engine 5, which gives photorealistic graphics, right? So imagine, you know, your favorite brands in the metaverse, and you can buy these products using NFTs uh, instant transactions, uh, permanent ownership, and you have something that could be easily, you know, sold as well, traded, sold. So, you know, I think what this means for e-commerce is is just it's it's mind blowing, right? You have so many things that are possible, and uh, yeah, we're very happy to be at the forefront of that. And uh, really, you know, I love it when I can explain something that we're working on, and people are like, "Oh, I never thought I'd be able to do that in the metaverse." So um, that's, you know, that's probably one of the most exciting things for me. Cool. You know, you mentioned um, Unreal Engine um, a little bit, and uh, oh, it's definitely come up a lot um, in, the, in the podcast and various projects. But um, uh, is there a little bit more we can say just for, for my benefit and maybe the audience has been about Unreal Engine, like what it facilitates and, you know, um, what they're doing and, and how big of a role it plays in metaverses? Um, yeah. Daniel, you mentioned it, so I'll, I'll ask you first and then Ed, if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think Unreal Engine is great. Uh, basically, it's part of that technology that we've achieved in, you know, confluence with, with blockchain and, um, you know, other aspects that allow a metaverse to exist. So I think Unreal Engine is one of those technologies that allows a metaverse to exist. You know, and if you look at projects like Decentraland, not to knock them, or, you know, Sandbox, not to knock them, they're great. But I view them more as, you know, proofs of work, uh, or no, proofs of concept, sorry. Uh, so they've basically shown us that this concept of the metaverse uh, is doable, and they've done it in a very limited way, which is great. You know, like uh, Ed was saying, you know, we, we've all seen the movies or read the books, and, you know, that's really captured our imaginations. And now we actually have projects coming out with their versions of the metaverse. So, you know, as we progress, I think we're going to start um, seeing some amazing things. And, you know, Unreal Engine definitely plays a role in it and allows us to not only have beautiful graphics, you know, everybody loves beautiful graphics, but it's more than that. It's about having the level of interactivity where you can enable, you know, education in the metaverse uh, business in the metaverse and these really, you know, dynamic, uh, different features to actually give utility in the metaverse. So, uh, that's part of the reason that we've built our platform on unreal engine. 
Cool. Uh, Ed, uh, is, is Frogland is used on Unreal Engine? Like, what's your experience with it? I'm sure you have some experience. Yeah. I'd love to so, hear uh, it. Both platforms, Unreal Engine and Unity, are tremendous game development platforms. Um, again, going under the guise of trying to build something that's that's open and, and, and user friendly, we found that Unity is great for rapid development for, for I'd say, proof of concept work, um, and it's also very easy to be adapted by newcomers to the space who may want to start dabbling in creating assets and importing. So ultimately, we we realised that Unity is better suited for us, uh, but fundamentally. A game engine is a game engine, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. It really there are, there are many ways to skin a cat, and so how you want to develop your content is neither here nor there. Ultimately, it's the end result that matters. And both both products are absolutely tremendous. Are so used by AAA game development studios to make some amazing games, anyway. So, yeah, ultimately, the two two bits of software to go and develop develop the same kind of ideas. Appreciate that. Thank you for helping me learn a little bit about the tech there. <laughs> um, so I, we're about to wrap it up. So I just want to make sure everybody gets a moment to, uh, you know, tell people where to go to find out about you and, and uh, keep tabs on what's going on and, and have a moment to, to uh, you know, give your own uh, calls to action. So, Ed, uh, I'll let you go first and then we'll kick it over to Dan and then I'll take us out. Thank you. Um, uh, so I'd say frogland.io, um, all you need to know, you can find our Discord link there. That's definitely the most active place for any any uh, Frogland community member to, to, to join in on. Um, we have the Incredible Edge of NFT podcast as well. If anyone has not yet seen that for Frogland, please do check it out. Um, and we recently did a United Nations panel presenting NFTs in the metaverse to, uh, to the UN. So there's a few bits of media online that you can definitely find out more about Frogland, but ultimately, frogland.io. Buy frog, get land. <laughs> nice. And Daniel? Yeah, you can uh, check out our project on network, netvrk.co. Um, we publish most of our announcements on Twitter and Telegram, so that's the best way to keep uh, your finger on the pulse. And um, yeah, we, we are... Uh, we finished our, our initial stages of the transport sale, the transport NFT designed by famous uh, designer John Park, who's worked on great movies like uh, Planet of the Apes and uh, many other great movies by uh, George Lucas. So, uh, yeah, we are currently going to have our minting uh, in about a week from now. So we're looking forward to that. And um, we also have a mini game that will be uh, coming out by the end of the year. So we're very looking forward to that. It's going to allow people to take part in interactive mining. Uh, so you'll be controlling a character that, that does mining. So that should be uh, interesting. But yeah, uh, thank you for having uh, me, Ethan. It was great being on the panel with you and Ed. Ed, thank you. Sure. And sure. Uh, yeah, great conversation. Really enjoyed it. Awesome. Yeah, well, I'll take us out. And, and again, just remind people, uh, I'm with the Edge of NFT podcast. Uh, we did have an episode with, with Ed from Frogland and some, some of his collaborators. Um, so you can check that out, uh, iTunes, Spotify, and all podcasting platforms. Um, we, will, we are actually doing a, a uh, NFT drop in the coming days here, set to launch on Wednesday uh, at around noon Eastern time of a Spirit Seed collection of only 100 items. Um, each one of them will offset a year of, of an individual's carbon emissions, um, as well as get them a free VIP pass to our convention coming up, NFTLA, in February of 2022. And then shortly after, we'll be releasing our Living Tree NFT project, which plants 25 trees for every NFT that's minted, um, along with a host of other um, utilities and benefits of being an uh, a living tree holder. So um, you can you can just find out more at, uh, let's send you over to spiritseeds.xyz um, to get in the mix and get in our Discord channel. So uh, thank you guys very much. Uh, thanks uh, to uh, the the convention and, and Crypto Night as well. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in person and in the metaverse. <laughs> so yeah, thank you very much. Thank again. you.